One morning I walked into a church, but it wasn't on a Sunday. I looked around and I saw the empty seats, the sun glistening through the dust in the air. At first I was distraught at the sight of the empty chairs, but then I was filled with joy. I realized that the people who were once in those chairs were now outside of the building, working at their jobs, serving in their communities, laughing with their co-workers and growing with their families. They had the opportunity to be the church, not just sit in it. When will we be like them? When will we see the opportunity given to us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, bringing hope into the world. Stained glass can't pray for the sick. These walls can't preach the gospel, but you can. The building you're sitting in is just a building. But if you trust in Jesus, then you are the church. Hey, what's good, everybody? Good morning, great morning, better yet, and best of all, God morning. Once again, by the grace of God, welcome back to Insight Church Online, Insight Church at Home, Insight Church wherever you are in the world or out of the world, friends. Who knows? You could be on a rocket ship right now in outer space watching Insight Church online. Wherever you are, the Lord is there. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, Jesus says, I'm right there in the midst, folks. That is how and why we can have church digitally, virtually, wherever we are, because we are gathered in the name of the Lord, folks. Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor to be with you. And as always, I believe that today, it's going to be another life-changing, mind-renewing, faith-building time in God's Word. Open your heart. Get ready to receive. I hope you're excited about the Word of God. I hope you have great expectation for the Word of God. Declare your heart to be good soil for the seed of God's Word. Why do I say that? Because it is the quality of the soil of your heart that determines the productivity of the seed of God's Word. God's Word can grow as much to be as much fruitful uh, as your heart can bear, as, as much as your heart is prepared, folks, that determines the fruitfulness of the Word of God. So I hope you have great expectation and great enthusiasm as we get ready to study the Word of God. I want to ask you to help us to continue to uh, evangelize across the Internet, to help us make disciples uh, in this digital age by sharing the link for today, friends. Make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Uh, to like today's online service. Make sure you subscribe uh, to my YouTube channel and go ahead and copy the link and send it out to someone who needs the word. Uh, one thing is for sure, every person in our nation and across this world needs the word of God. And we have the opportunity to reach as many people as we possibly can through digital means. We need your help, friends. Let's make a pact. By God's grace, I'll preach the word of God. And if you would, help us to share it. Uh, with those who need to hear the goodness of our Lord Jesus Christ and what it is that he's come to do for us. Thanks so much for being here. Just a reminder, wherever you are, especially across the Chicagoland area, despite which, you know, campus that you're at, whether it's a Tinley campus or a Skokie campus, I just want you to remind, be reminded that on Saturday, March 11th, we're having a celebration luncheon uh, just to acknowledge uh, some of the amazing things that God has done in our church, friends. Uh, God has just done a miraculous work last year uh, to position our church to create a new wine skin. Folks, I'm going to be talking about that. Remember, Jesus says for there to be new wine, there has to be a new wine skin. I'm telling you, Insight Church in 2022 became a new wine skin that's ready to receive new wine. And God has reformatted our church to use our church in ways that we cannot imagine. We're going to celebrate that and we're going to talk about that on Saturday, March 11th. It's a ticketed event, a lunch. It's going to start at 12 o'clock p.m. in Skokie at the Doubletree Hotel. Please, 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 I want to ask you for this very special occasion. 
go to our church app or to our website, get your ticket, be there. Um, it's going to be a historic moment uh, in the future of our church. I want to invite you to join us for that event. We're going to have a great time that entire weekend, so plan to celebrate with us March 11th, March 12th here at Insight Church. The only other thing I want to do is just to encourage you to give folks to continue to be all in, as we say here at Insight Church, folks. We only give the Lord our best. We give him everything because he owns everything. We're not owners. We're just stewards of the goodness that God has uh, entrusted to us. And we just want to uh, bring our tithe and bring our offering to worship the Lord, not out of obligation, but only out of opportunity, friends. This is our time to worship the Lord, to bless him, to show our gratitude, not only for what he's done for us, but our gratitude for what he will do through us when we give and when we're generous to be a blessing to others, friends. There's a few ways for you to give here at Insight Church to be a participant, to be in the game, to be a builder with us of the mission and the vision that God has given us. Scan the QR code, uh, use your church app to give, text to the number you see on your screen or mail your support to our post office box. Visit our website at any time as well. Thank you so much uh, from the bottom of my heart for being a partner with us in the Lord's work. Well, the word of God is about to come forth. This series that we've been teaching on forward, God's mandate for us is to move forward, both individually as families, but also as a church. I believe God is calling the body of Christ forward, friends. But then we've been talking about first things first, setting right priority in our lives, especially if we start, as we started a new year. But you know what, friends? I've been teaching on what it means to be partakers with Christ. And we've been talking about the divine nature of God in you folks. Today, I'm going to talk about flesh and blood, friends. Big, big, big deal. That flesh and blood has not revealed to us the kingdom of God and the things of God, that Christ is the son of God. But through his flesh and blood, he has revealed to us all that God is, friends. The teaching is going to be good. Open your heart. Get ready to receive. I know you're going to be changed. I'll be back in a moment. As we get into the word, Father, we thank you so much for your word. Oh, how we love your law. It is our meditation all the day and you through your commandments. You make us wiser than our enemies. We ask you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that the entrance of your word gives light and gives understanding to the simple. We ask you to open the eyes of our understanding that we may comprehend the scriptures. Father, we thank you that we are graced like the sons of Issachar to discern the season and the times that we are in. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are our comforter, our teacher, our parakletos, the one who gives us the advantage in this life and all circumstances of life. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot see and does not know, but we see you and we know you because you're not only with us, but you're in us. And we ask you today that you would increasingly form within each one of us the character, the very nature of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that you would bring about the reality of his kingdom in our lives and through our lives to the world around us that so desperately needs it. In Jesus' name, everybody wholeheartedly agreed and said, Amen. all right, well, let's get to work here. We're continuing to teach. Um, you guys know I'm teaching eight series all at the same time, and um, that's just kind of how I do it. But somehow it all fits together. It all works together in a, in a tremendous way. So we've been talking about this theme of forward. Everybody say forward. forward. That is God's word, a single word for us this year. God is calling us to move forward. And um, we started last week with just an explosive teaching, talking about what it means to be partakers with Christ and we're going to continue that today. Uh, we didn't get past point number one last week. We're not going to get past point number one this week. I can already tell you we got eight or nine more to go. But um, this is going to be a life changing message. And I pray that you would open your heart uh, to receive what it is that the Lord has for you. I, I have a, a custom word for you. And I, I couldn't be more sure in knowing that, that I have the right word, I believe, for this church at the right time. God is speaking to us about what it means to be partakers with Christ as we continue this idea of first things first and setting right uh, priorities in our life. So listen, if you, if you stay, talking about forward, if you stay where you are, 
and stay how you are, you will be out of God's will for your life. If you stay where you are, and if you stay how you are, no matter who you are, and no matter where you are, if you stay where you are, and if you stay how you are at this moment, you will live out of God's will for your life. He has called and is calling every one of us to move forward and to grow in Christ's likeness without limits. It's God's plan for every human being, for every one of us here today. That's, that's really all heaven thinks about concerning your life is how to move you forward in the purposes of God, but how to, um, you know, see you grow in Christ's likeness. We're going to see what that means in terms of the work that uh, Christ has done to give us the great privilege and the opportunity to grow in his nature and in his likeness. So if you stay where you are and stay how you are, each of us, we will live out of God's uh, will for our life. We've been teaching on preeminence with Christ. Uh, we took a detour. We're talking about what it means to be partakers with Christ. And we need to talk about what it means to be partakers with Christ because not only does the scripture teach preeminence, the preeminence of Christ, the Bible also teaches the preeminence of the church in Christ, the preeminence of the church in Christ. And so our lives being in union with the Lord, John 14, 20 or so, uh, one of the most amazing statements that the, the Bible um, you know, communicates when Jesus says, in that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That, that blows me away. And Jesus, think about that. Jesus says, in that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Come on, come on, folks. God is calling us forward and calling us better to move. That's, that's encouraging, what it means to be partakers with Christ. And so we're going we're gonna to dig into this a little bit. And we need, we need sound doctrine, as I said before, um, in the emerging church, that this kind of teaching con concerning uh, Christ-centeredness and what it means to be a partaker with Christ is becoming more and more rare. I mean, imagine a general fighting a war, and he's training his, his troops with crayons and coloring books. And I'm telling you, that's, a, that's a, a description of what happens on Sunday mornings in many churches. People are at war and are being taught from crayons with crayons and coloring books. You know, one of the things is we travel and we hear from people all across the nation that, you know, we kind of went through a cycle where, yes, and it was necessary to teach God's people, to teach us how to be successful. But during that same period, Folks weren't talking about Christ enough. And while becoming more successful, them and their children and their families were being ravaged. And many people have exited the church because of they're successful, but because there's so much dysfunction in their life because of a lack of Christ likeness. And so there's a lot that needs to happen right now in teaching people about Christ and how to be like Jesus. That's the goal how to see the character of Christ emulated and replicated in our, in our lives. And so this teacher is very, very important for us to, um, to embrace during this time. Uh, Satan is not afraid or threatened by your net worth. He's threatened by your divine nature. He's, he's threatened by the degree to which you are like Jesus and function in his power and in his authority. So that is the thing that the Lord is communicating to our hearts right now. Let's, let's dig in here. Let's get going here and look through the word of God. Let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, Going to lay some foundation here before we dig into, again, this idea of uh, sharing in Christ's divine nature. Let's start here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Just talking about the importance of sound doctrine. Paul writes this, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Talking about the beginning stages of their involvement in the things of God. Verse 2, he makes this statement, At that time I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, even now you are still not able. So, of course, in the beginning stages... Paul says, you weren't ready for the deeper things of God, and so I fed you milk 
and not meat, not solid food. But look at the contrast from the writers and the writer in, uh, of Hebrews, the mess, writer to the Messianic Jews. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 says this, for though by this time, so in other words, with the passage of time, you see a maturation, the maturity taking place here. So now by this time, no longer based, but having matured in the things of God, by this time, he says, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. He says in verse 13, for everyone who partakes only of milk, very important, is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So if there's not a progression from milk to meat, from milk to solid food, he says that that means that that individual is unskilled. Everybody say unskilled. Very important term there. It's unskilled in the word of righteousness. That communicates that there is a uh, there are mechanics, there are rudiments, there is a wielding of the word of God that God's people are growing in as we, as we advance, as we mature, as the hour gets later, we're becoming more skillful in handling the word of righteousness, which is also the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we're growing in our skillfulness of, hand, skillfulness of handling the sword of the spirit, of the word of God, that as we encounter greater and greater warfare and the enemy comes down in great wrath because he knows he has but a short time, we see the kind of darkness that's happening in the world. Each of us as God's people must become more skilled in handling the word of righteousness. We got to become more skilled that the present level of skill is certainly not sufficient for the things that we will continue to face. And so I want you to be encouraged to be more skilled in the things of God. Now, when we talk about being skilled in the word of righteousness, this is, this is true. You can be highly unintelligent and be unskilled in the word. You can also uh, not be that intelligent and be highly skilled in the word. Being skilled in the word is not about intellect. It's really, it, it really begins with, with an act of humility in terms of us embracing the truth of God's word, growing in our ability to exercise our faith. And so don't, don't think that, in, that intellect means that you are skilled in the word of righteousness. Any more than your intellect means that you know how to handle a sword. It's a, it's a skill that has to be developed. And, and I want us to be encouraged to not allow uh, intellect to deceive us into thinking that we are skilled in the word of righteousness. I'm telling you, 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 can, you can be brilliant. Your life is falling apart. But being skilled in the word of righteousness is something that we need to be intent about during this time. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13, New Living Translation, says this, For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. It's a skill set, training, the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong, and certainly the courage to do it. Somebody say amen. All right, here, next, next part, a little review here. We saw this last time, through Christ God did the unthinkable and reconciling the irreconcilable. Reconciling the irreconcilable. And I said last, last week, I gave an analogy of remember, uh, think about a barrier, an impenetrable barrier between humanity and divinity that cannot be crossed. Uh, Jesus crossed that barrier to make the two to become one. Humanity and divinity, divinity. He reconciled the irreconcilable by bringing divinity and humanity together um, in the person. The Bible talks about that in, in Ephesians chapter 2, um, saying that Christ, Christ himself is our peace. There's no hope for what we see in society. Uh, reconciliation is the work of Christ exclusively. That only he can deal with the barriers and bring down those barriers so that hearts and people uh, can, be, can be reconciled. So keep that in mind, this idea of bringing humanity and divinity together 
And this has everything to do with us being partakers with Christ, which positions us again to understand the preeminence of the church in Christ for what it is that God intends to do. Um, one, of the, one of the most powerful, we're going to see here, one of the most powerful combination of scriptures uh, in, the, in the word of God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. I really want to encourage you to, you to get this. Powerful combination of scriptures here, a principle called um, the analogy of faith or analogy of fidei of, of interpreting scripture with scripture. Scripture is its own best interpreter. So look at these two passages of scripture concerning us being partakers with the, of the nature of Christ, of the divine nature. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 says this, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, verse 51, after he yielded his spirit, or died, so to speak, verse 51, then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. So we left off here last time. I quoted this, but I wanted to come back to see the scripture. When he yielded his spirit, then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Keep that picture in mind. Now, let's use scripture to compare scripture. Take a look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. So you see a picture there in Matthew chapter uh, 27. When he yielded up the spirit of God, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom. But then the writer of Hebrews tells us here that we have boldness to enter through that veil into the holy of holies, into the holiest, that we have boldness to enter the holiest by two things, by the blood of Jesus, number one, get this, a new and a living way which he consecrated for who? For us through the veil that is his flesh. In other words, it wasn't about the veil in the temple after he died. That veil being torn in two was symbolic of his flesh being torn to open the way, a path that's been consecrated by the blood of Jesus for us to enter into the holy, holy of holies, into the presence of God. Amen. Come on, folks, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what was accomplished through his death on the cross and his flesh being torn by the blood of Jesus, us having access to enter into the the very presence of God. Hebrews 10, verse 20 from the Amplified Bible says this. says, by this fresh, new, and living way. Don't we need a fresh way right now? A new and a living way? By a fresh, new, and a living way. Life, life is so stale and depressing without Jesus. But a fresh, a new, and a living way has been opened, which he initiated and dedicated and opened for us. But we have to choose through the separating curtain, which is the veil of the Holy of Holies, that is, through his flesh. This is one of the greatest truths in Scripture. This is, this is the, the, the main idea, the central idea of what I'm communicating with you today. This is, a, this is an apologetical truth that every child needs to understand this. That through Jesus' death on the cross and the tearing and the brokenness of his body by the blood of Jesus, a new, fresh, and living way has been consecrated for every child who's born again to enter into the presence of God. One of the most important truths in the scripture. This is the thing that makes us distinct as Christians. This is one of the things that, that some however you want to look at it, enlightened or unenlightened professor can't talk you out of when you understand that through the broken body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has given me boldness to enter into the holy of God for me to be a partaker of the nature of God. 
There is no wisdom tradition and no religion anywhere on the face of this planet that offers you that. It's the distinction of who we are and knowing whose we are during this time. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right, let's go a little bit deeper here. You can see I'm not rushing through this because this is, this is foundational. This is fundamental. Let's go a little bit deeper. Listen at this. Remember now, through the veil of his flesh, by the blood, consecrated a new and a living way for us. Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. Massive, massive. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? question that Jesus is asking. Them, us, everybody. (laughs) One question. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, big deal. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, huge, 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 for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Now, he goes on to talk about, and upon this rock I will build my church. We're coming back to that. Then he talks about building the church, and then he talks about, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Then he begins to talk about the church's authority. But building the church and the church's authority was contingent upon a recognition of who he was, something that flesh and blood or humanity could not and did not reveal to Peter. Something divine was released and communicated to him by God that was the foundation of the building and the authority of the church. He says flesh and blood did not not communicate that to you. Remember we just read? Through the veil of his flesh and by his blood, we have boldness to enter the holies. Jesus tells Peter here that that flesh and blood or humanity did not reveal that to you. Mm. Folks, I, I wanna, I wanna, I'm getting at something. When I talk about new wine, I have a tendency to think and to speak prophetically about where God is taking the church and not where we are. And I'm telling you an understanding of the power of humanity being married to divinity and the nature of God on the inside of you, I'm talking about a church that's empowered with the life of God that will operate in a level of authority that the world has never seen before. Never seen before. And get this, flesh and blood can't reveal that. There is nothing natural in this world capable of communicating to you the reality of the divinity that God has for you and the supernatural things of God. We're talking about something that only comes from the throne room of God. Come on, stay with me now. We're just, we're just laying some foundation. Take, take, a, take a look at this principle. Flesh and blood, I tried to do my best to, to explain this. Flesh and blood or humanity could not reveal God or divinity to humanity. But divinity, who is Christ, used flesh and blood, which was his humanity, to teach humanity, to reach humanity, and to make humanity become divine. It took me about 20 minutes to try to get that, get that right. <laughs> listen, listen, flesh and blood, or humanity, people's stuff, could not reveal the eternal God, or divinity, to humanity, but Christ in his divinity used flesh and blood, which was his humanity, to reach humanity and to make humanity to become divine. There's not, there's not, a, there's not, a, bigger, there's not a bigger deal in Scripture. There's not a greater truth in Scripture concerning who we who we are. It's fundamental for the power of God, the anointing of God, the wisdom of God. This is is why no cessationist can talk me out of supernatural healing. 
because Jesus used his flesh and blood through the veil of his flesh and the blood consecrated a new and a living way for us to enter the presence of God behind the veil. He used his humanity, his flesh and blood to bring us into God's divinity. And he tells Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter. <laughs> Folks, there is a realm infinitely beyond the natural that is available and accessible and accessible to God's people that God has intended for us to live in as we become partakers of the divine nature of God. Come on, flesh, flesh and blood is the issue. Nothing human could reveal that to you. But through his flesh and his blood, he reveals to us the divine nature of God. Are you with me this morning? I got plenty of stuff to preach, but I'm just which, <laughs> not in a hurry at all. Not in a hurry at all. Partakers of the divine nature. Galatians 3.13, look at a few more here. It says this, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see through that transaction again, and the curse being taken by Christ, he brings us into the blessing. It's all about God's purposes, all about through Christ, humanity meeting God's divinity and humanity being empowered and enabled to take on the divine nature of God. The curse has been taken, has been broken, that the blessing of Abraham will come upon us. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, we saw this last time, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, divinity meeting humanity, to make us partakers with Christ. Only one mediator between God and man, between divinity and, and, and humanity, Christ is that mediator. It's very important for us to understand this. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6 says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Listen to this, that we should be what? And without blame before him in love. Verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Christ Jesus to himself. That was God's plan from before the beginning is for you and I. He predestined us to be adopted into the family of God, to become part of God's family. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That was God's mandate, God's assignment for you, long before your parents, long before you were born, long before time began. God had already ordained for your humanity and his divinity to come together. And we are, we are, we are predestined. There's, there's, it's our default tendency as believers. We have a proclivity and an inclination to be married to the divine. We have a longing to be married to the divine in our humanity. He ordained it from before the foundation of the world, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse six, to the praise of the glory of his grace, huge, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. He made us accepted in the beloved. Humanity accepted in divinity. And this is, this is, this is who we are, folks. This is, a, this is a message of identity, of being reminded of who we are in Christ and how God sees you and the provision that he's made for every one of us before the foundation of the world. Somebody say amen. amen. Can, you, can you see how, I mean, we can, we can blow through life, spinning our wheels, wasting time, making no progress, not going anywhere, not doing anything significant when we don't understand this. To actually know who we are as God has, has predestined us to be, to be partakers with Christ. I shared last time, partakers, what it means to be a partaker. Koinonos, it means we've been 
predestined to be a sharer, a partner, or a companion with Christ in God's divine nature. He's made it, he's made it available to us. We're, we're partakers, and I said before, this is the time that one of the few times we absolutely need entitlement mentality to know who we are and what it is that uh, we have access to through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just go back to number one. We didn't get too far yet. Number one, what it means to be partakers with Christ. I have about nine of these. The first one is this. We are partakers of Christ's divine nature and his holiness. We are partakers of Christ's divine nature, the character of Christ, the life of Christ in the, in the kingdom of God, the difference between salvation and sanctification. Salvation, of course, was the entry point, but then from that moment of salvation, the things that our lives should most be concerned with is sanctification, which is us being partakers of Christ's divine nature. As I shared last week, it is God's will for the divine nature of God to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow for us to continuously become more and more and more and more and more and more like Jesus as the divine nature of God is growing inside of us. And it's not until the divine nature becomes stronger than the old nature and the carnal nature that we begin to walk in victory. I'm explaining to you how, why so many of us as God's people, we walk in defeat, we walk in brokenness. It simply means that the old nature is, is stronger or more influential than the divine nature. That's all it means. And this is God's, God's will, God's plan for our lives, not just salvation, but, but sanctification. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4 it tells us here, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. We're going to come back to that given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these, through those exceedingly great and precious promises, which is the word of God, through them and through them alone, you become partakers of the divine, the, the, the thios. We become partakers of God-likeness. Come on, are you with me? Through these exceedingly great and precious promises, we become partakers of thios. God likeness, the very nature of God himself, we become participants, sharers, companion. We're growing, transformation, sanctification is happening through the word of God that we're becoming more and more and more. The nature of God himself is being replicated in our lives. Amen. Folks, this is, this is a massive deal. This is a massive deal. To become partakers of the divine nature, listen at this part having escaped the corruption, the moral decay that is in the world through lust. So get it. No way to escape the moral decay until you first get the divine nature. The only way to escape the, the moral decay and the corruption that is in this world, this is huge. It is the divine nature that destroys the corruption. And there's no other way to, to escape it. There's no other way to get free from the bondage of this world, the sin nature, until the divine nature begins to grow on the inside of us through the exceeding great and precious promises of God. Are you with me this morning? No other way to, to escape it. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, from the Amplified Bible, for those whom he foreknew, we just read this in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4, it talked about us being predestined um, to be uh, adopted as sons. For those, those whom he foreknew, of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he also destined from the beginning for ordaining them. Come on, long before life damaged you. Long before the victimizations, long before the tragedy long before that unthinkable incident that, that destroyed you emotionally, that destroyed you mentally, that destroyed you spiritually, long before that, God foreordained from the beginning, loved you beforehand, foreknew you, was aware of you and the incident itself long before that, and he predestined you to be like his son, to take on his divine nature. 
Somebody say amen. Come on, come on. Because life, life is damaging. Let me tell you, I, 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 I say this, I write about life is perfectly designed to make a victim out of you. We live in a hostile world. I'm, I'm telling you, life intense. Satan is the ultimate victimizer, the ultimate abuser. It is part of this life, but the only way to escape the corruption that is in this world is for the divine nature of God to grow on the inside of you. It's God's, it's God's remedy for every problem, every challenge, every obstacle. I'm, I'm good coming to talk to the pastors, come talk to the elders. We can give you a little bit of advice. But until the divine nature grows on the inside of you, I'm telling you, that's, we can't help you escape from the corruption. Our job is to teach you the great and precious promises for the divine nature of God to grow in you, which breaks you free from the moral decay and the corruption of this world. Being skilled, as we saw, in the word of righteousness. Not just babes and milk, but strong meat. Folks, I'm I'm telling you, life is intended to damage, break, and destroy people. But he that is in us is what? Come on, shout is what? Than he that is in the world. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. He also destined us from the beginning for ordaining them to be molded into the image of his son, get this, and share inwardly his likeness. To share inwardly, inwardly his likeness. Here's the reason why. That he might become just the firstborn among many brethren. It's one thing for us to admire Jesus. We worship him. We absolutely do. But it's God's plan for us to not just worship Jesus, but for us to be like him. Come on, you really want to get God, you really want to get Jesus excited. It's one thing to give him praise to give him glory. We do. It's one thing to dance, dance, dance all night and shout and all that. Listen, let me tell you something. That's, that's wonderful. We give him the glory that is due his name. But you want to know what really, really turns him on is when you become like him and do what he does. When you begin to share in the inward nature of God so that he just becomes the firstborn of a whole lot of Jesuses. Come on, did Jesus have any bad days? Nope. Did Jesus have any struggles that he couldn't overcome? Nope. You know, I grew up, man, we, we meant well singing songs like I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. <laughs> I grew up singing that stuff, man, in the church. I was like, I'm coming up the rough side of the mountain. Nobody ever talked to me about Jesus saying you can speak to the mountain and tell it to be removed and go somewhere. Then ain't ain't nothing to come up on the rough side of. Nobody nobody talked that. Nobody talked that. Folks, I'm, I'm talking about a revolution that happens in life when we understand that we are partakers of the divine nature of God. Somebody say amen. Oh, glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. I'll give you a couple more here. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised. Everybody say incorruptible. incorruptible. The dead is going to be raised incorruptible. Hold that thought. And we shall be what? Amen. Okay, verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. That's God's end game for us. Corruption, putting on incorruption. Mortality, putting on immortality. Verse 54. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Verse 57, but thanks be to God 
who gives. It does say he will give us. Now, it says one day corruption is going to put on incorruption and one day mortality is going to put on immortality. But it says for those of us, you can thank God now because he gives, not will give you, but he gives us the victory. Get this victory over corruption, victory over mortality brings us through the divine nature into immortality, into incorruption through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now. Now. It's what the Bible calls concerning the person of the Holy Spirit, the down payment or the earnest on the purchased possession. It's God already giving us a taste of what it means to walk in incorruption and immortality here in this world. It's the divine nature that happens in our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. Let, me, let me give you another example. Lazarus died. Glory to God. He died. Now, Martha, she was the smart one in the family. Remember, remember I told you intellect doesn't, doesn't equal being skilled in a word of righteousness. She was, she, was, she was pretty smart, and it seems like she had a degree in eschatology. <laughs> All the end times. But she's, Jesus comes to Martha, and uh, he's there to raise Lazarus from the dead. And Martha, she engages Jesus. I know he's going to be raised in the last day. And watch this. Jesus says, the last day. He says, Martha, I am the resurrection. All that corruption putting on incorruption and that mortality that's going to put on immortality. She says, I know it's going to happen one day. Jesus says, today is the day. I'm the resurrection. And anyone who believes on me, that though he die, yet shall he live. They would never see death. Because he said, I'm, 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 I'm the, the resurrection. Are you hearing me? I'm, talk, I'm talking about Amen. the divine nature of God. It's not just waiting for the incorruption and immortality. When, when divinity met humanity through the veil, when that veil was torn the veil of his flesh and the blood of Jesus consecrated a new and a living way. He gave us access to the resurrection power of God that we can walk in the incorruption and the immortality. Now, that's developed in us through these exceeding great and precious promises. We are partakers of the divine nature of God and we are empowered and enabled to escape the corruption in the world. Yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm talking about a foretaste of the afterlife in this life because divinity has met humanity. Come on, am I making sense to anybody? He asked Martha, but do you believe this? He explained it to her, but he tells Martha, do you believe this? And thankfully, she answered and said the same thing. You read the passage, she said the same thing that Peter said. She says, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. Yes. Folks, that is the key. That is the key. Knowing that Messiah Jesus has brought divinity through his humanity so that humanity can now become divine. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, a couple more here. We're going we're gonna to finish this first point. We're going to do this. <laughs> Let's look, look at a few more scriptures here to substantiate this. First John chapter 4, verse 17. Huge. Everybody say love. love. Man, that's a whole other dimension of this teaching. Love, watch this, has been perfected among us in this. In other words, John's about to say, I'm going to tell you about the perfection of God's love. When, it's come to, when it comes to full maturity, the fullest expression of God's love, he says love has been perfected among us. You don't, you don't read that anywhere in Scripture when the Bible talks about love perfected. Love perfected among us is this, 
that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Remember we read through the veil of his flesh and the blood has consecrated with boldness. We have access through a new and a living way to enter the presence behind the veil. John picks up on that and talks about love being perfected. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Listen at these words. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Not we're going to be one day. Lord, I know he's going to be raised in the last day. No, Jesus says, I am the resurrection. The word of God says this, as he is, wherever Jesus is in the throne room of God right now, whatever his state of being, whatever his condition, whatever the characteristics of his life right now, now, as he is at this moment, so are we right now in this world. Not how we are down here. Who wants that? However he is in the throne room of God, that's who I am right now as a partaker of his divine nature. Satan's job is to keep us from understanding that. To make us feel is as we are in this world. No, it's not how I am. I care what my body says. I care what the symptoms say. I don't care what the university said. I don't care what my parents did. I don't care what has happened to me in life. I am a partaker of the divine nature as he is right now. That's how I am in the world. That's a game changer, folks. It's a game changer. Christianity can't be more relevant than that statement. You hear, you hear folks sometimes talking this stuff. Anybody ever heard like deconstruction? You know, that's, that's kind of like if you're into that stuff, people sometimes kind of go through these cycles of years of theology and church stuff and church history. And you just got so, you know, you know so much. You get to a place that it all starts to kind of unravel and then they have this term called deconstruction. I ain't in no deconstruction. I'm, I'm in construction. Because Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. That's construction. That's not deconstruction. When you simply know that he is the Christ, and I have the divine nature of God operative in my life. Come on, folks, we're getting stronger in that. Getting stronger. The divine nature. Somebody say amen. amen. As he is, so are we in this world. First Peter chapter two, verse chapter one, verse twenty-two. We saw this before through the exceeding great and precious promises. The Bible says we're partakers of the divine nature. Let's pick that idea up again in First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-two. Get this. Since you, everybody say me. me. It says here, since you have purified your souls. Isn't that interesting that Peter doesn't say, well, God's going to purify your soul. Thank you, Lord. Purify me. Yeah don't, yeah, don't pray that prayer too much. Remember now, milk, strong meat, skilled in the word of righteousness. Watch this idea. You have to purify your own soul. What's purifying your soul? Getting rid of the corruption to put on incorruption. He explains it here. Since you have purified your own souls, this is how? In obeying the what? The truth through the what? Big deal, insincere what? Man. This is, this is how you move from corruption and grow in the divine nature 
You purify your own soul. Number one, it takes obedience. If you harbor disobedience in your life, the corruption will be resident in your life. Your life will be defined by corruption, number one, if you live in disobedience. So number one, obeying. Number two, you got to have the truth. It happens through the Spirit. Here's the big one. In sincere love, not for God. Come on, folks. <laughs> I'm explaining to you why there's so much corruption in the church, right? I just love God. I love God. Oh, God, I love it. I lo- God, I love you. Corrupt as you can be. Now, it's not just love for God. Obeying the truth through the Spirit, this is how you get rid of the corruption. Insincere love for the brethren. I'm, I'm telling you why transformation into the image and the likeness of Christ and the divine nature stops. Let me tell you something. It's too, it's too expensive for me to be offended with you. That's too costly. Are y'all hearing me this morning? Let me tell you something. I don't, I don't mean it the wrong way. You're not worth. Come on. You know, you know how costly it is for me to not love you and not, not walk in humility and see to it that my heart is right. I'm ticked off, got an attitude, offendance, won't talk, the root of resentment, bitterness, all that stuff. It's too costly for me. It keeps me from the divine nature of God. It's too costly. It's too expensive. Come on, man. Don't let your enemies rob you of the divine nature that God predestined for your life before the foundation of the world. It's too costly to not love. It's too costly. I, sh- I shared something the other day. You know, I get Sharon by herself. I start preaching to her. Laying some deep word on her. She has to sit there and listen. <laughs> she just, just going to take it all in. I was telling her the other day, I said, you know, you know one of the reasons at least why, why Jesus commands us to love our enemies is because the, the closest agent and representative that Jesus has for your enemy, which he loves, is you. This, this, listen, the, love your enemy. The, the closest agent that Jesus has for your enemy that he loves is you. And now the love of God has to come through the one who's been offended in the interest of reading, reaching your enemy. God says, you're, that's great. You're the closest representative I have for them. God's not thinking about your offense and your, your issues. Jesus already tells them, if you don't forgive them, God won't forgive you. The issue is not forgiveness. Don't ever pray to God about what your enemy did to you. Lord, they hurt me. They did this. He, I'm not trying to hear that. Is there enough of, the divi- of my divine nature in you to redeem your enemy? Sincere love for the brethren. Yes, sir. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> Let me wrap this up. Since you appear, look at this, you purify your own souls from corruption to incorruption in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren. Again, love one another fervently with a pure heart. How? Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's divinity. Living and abiding in our lives. He goes on to say, you know what? All flesh is grass. That's humanity. But the word of God endures forever. And it's us being born again through the incorruptible seed seed of God's word, the exceedingly great and precious promises causes us to partake 
of the divine nature. The degree to which you immerse yourself in the scriptures and take on the life of God's word determines where you are between corruption and incorruption and how much of God's nature is being born and developed on the inside of you. Are you with me? Yeah. Romans eight nineteen, New Living Translation. For all creation, we saw this last time, is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against his will, partakers of Christ, against his will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children, when it will catch up to us and join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. Romans 8.11 says this, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells where? In you. He who raised Christ from the dead, get this, will what? Also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Same spirit that raised him from the dead, dwelling in you, will also give that same resurrection life to your mortal, mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says this, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised, same way, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness and life. Folks, it's all throughout the world. Word of God, just as Christ, you also. Just as Christ, you also. Just as Christ, you also. 1 Corinthians six fourteen, And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Here's a big one. Hebrews 3, 14, huge. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our what? Everybody shout confidence. confidence. Listen at this. We will have become partakers of Christ conditional if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. What, what society is intending to do right now is to break the confidence of God's people. It's what you call cancel culture or whatever. It's a spirit of intimidation to break your confidence steadfast. And the Bible says that a part of us becoming partakers with Christ, you got to make sure you keep your confidence in who you are in Christ and the divine nature of God in you. And I said before, no professor can talk your kids out of that when they have confidence. We've got to maintain our confidence no matter what. Somebody say amen. amen. Hebrews 2.10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation. Perfect through sufferings. Massive. Verse 11. For he, both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified, that's us, are all of what? The one who is doing the sanctifying and those who are being sanctified, the objects of his sanctification, the Bible says they're one. And for this reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We're the same. Got the same daddy. You get what I get. You an heir and a joint heir. He doesn't love me more than he loves you. Equal love. God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Because the one who is doing the sanctifying. Watch this. And get this. Those who are being sanctified. You ain't sanctified yet. Still messing up, still tripping up, still causing problems. Doesn't matter. Because the one who does the sanctifying has married himself to the people who are in the process of being sanctified. And so he, you take on his righteousness and the divinity in your humanity. I'm going to stop, my man, the gym. I, gotta, I just got to turn it off, man. You guys get anything out of the word of God this morning? Oh, my goodness. Come on and stand to your feet. 
You know, I... Oh, my goodness. Are you grateful this morning for Jesus? Thank you, Lord. Blessed assurance. You know it, sing it. Here it is. of your atonement as the propitiation for our sins, Lord God. I thank you for your life-giving spirit that breathes life and brings newness of life and renewal into the lives of your people. Lord, I thank you for the resurrection power of God that every dead thing, every dormant thing, I declare today that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I thank you for your life-giving spirit. I thank you, Father God, for steadfast confidence, strength of heart and mind, that you arm us with strength for the day of battle. We commend ourselves to your good grace, and we thank you for your hand upon us as partakers of your own divine nature. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. 